chapter 30, middle passage. Especially because we were in the South, I closely watched the signs on the roads and the vehicle permits. We rode through Mississippi and then through Memphis, Tennessee. After being on the highway for 12 hours, falling asleep and reawakening a few times because of the hard seats, handcuffs cutting into the skin on my wrists and steel shackles rubbing up against my ankle bones, I realized we were in Arkansas, 20 miles from the Oklahoma border. What woke me up this last time was a bunch of yelling. I looked up and everybody was yelling out the windows at two young white girls in a convertible Mustang that pulled up beside the prison bus flirting and flashing their titties while driving around 40 miles per hour. The prison bus had a security escort van driven by U.S. Marshals that trailed it. It was loaded with weapons in case of an escape attempt. They turned off their strobe lights and sirens, scaring off the girls who took a quick exit. We were pissed. We called the officers a bunch of suckers and every other derogatory name in the book. Then we looked up and they were pulling up again, this time totally topless, licking their tongues out and yelling out their phone numbers for us to call them. The van sirens flashed again and they took off. This time they didn't return. Because of security concerns, the marshals thought it was a decoy or a distraction for an escape attempt. So as we crossed into Oklahoma, a squad of Oklahoma sheriffs pulled up to escort us while the bus took an alternative route as an evasive method. They took dirt roads surrounded by thick woods, slowly driving by 18th century houses that looked like slave plantations, KKK headquarters, or places where pedophiles congregated. Some people thought the marshals were taking us somewhere to be lynched. The road was pitch black except for the dull lights on the law enforcement vehicles and the glowing eyes of black bears shining from the woods. After about 30 minutes, we emerged back onto an empty pitch black highway. The 12 hour trip had now turned into almost 15 hours and my back, neck and legs were throbbing from the pain from being in a stagnant position. My ankles were raw and numb. My hands were swollen from a lack of circulation. My wrist felt sprained and my head was pounding. My temples felt like a bass drum being kicked by a steel toe boot. I was nauseous, tired and hungry. My mouth was dry from thirst and my breath smelled like death. I wondered if this was what the middle passage felt like. We were fed bologna sandwiches, an apple and a small apple juice, but that was 10 hours ago. Our stomachs were empty and we were dehydrating. I was only 18, but some of the elder prisoners were having a hard time breathing and coping. They were squirming in their seats in pain and yelling to the officers to hurry up and get to the damn prison. Finally, after 16 hours, we pulled up at FCI El Reno in central Oklahoma, an old decrepit prison that was built in 1933. In the 70s, it had a youth program and it was primarily used to house young adults but now it's for ordinary age convicts. Fort Reno military base was eight minutes away. El Reno reminded me of Lorton with its ancient industrial warehouse type of facade and a chow hall that resembled a hospital ward from a Wes Craven film. It had a yard big enough for three football fields and an impressive outdoor and indoor weight pile. It also had cell blocks with cells instead of dormitories like Lawton. The cells had steel bars like DC jail instead of wood doors like Talladega. These cell blocks were like the prisons I saw on TV. Four stories high and a long row of cells on each floor. The walkways were fenced off so no one could be thrown off the top tiers. Because of overcrowding, I was placed on the bottom floor on a cot in an open area along with 15 other guys from D.C. until an empty cell became available. I would have to stay in this block until I'm classified and moved on to the compound officially. The three bandits were taken straight to the hole and placed on investigation for the rapes in Alabama. One day someone threw some juice off of one of the tears and it landed on us. D.C. dudes were known to stick together and known to crush anyone, so whoever did it was either extremely naive or suicidal. We all took off running up the stairs and onto the tears to find out who threw it. It was impossible to know who did it, but as we were walking the tears, a Native American guy pulled up on us and told us who did it. 
There was some juice drips on the ground in front of his cell so we didn't waste any time. No talking or asking questions. We beat him and his cellmate into submission and checked them in. Sent them straight to protective custody. The next day I moved into a cell with one of the homies. Officers only walked along tiers at count time, so all types of activities happened on each floor. On the top tier was a whorehouse, a cell with two homosexual prostitutes, a white one and a Hispanic. Perverts of all races and from different cities were lined up in front of the cell with bags of canteen consisting of cigarettes, ramen noodles, tuna, sardines, Kool-Aid, all of them just waiting for their turn to have sex. Down the tier from them was a cell we called the store. It was loaded with food, cosmetics, and tobacco, and the convict who lived there ran it like a normal deli. Money with cigarettes. A pack could get you a couple packs of chips. They also did two-for-ones, meaning if you got a product on consignment, you had to pay them back too. The compound was set up like apartment projects. There were a lot of old buildings and walkways. The grass consisted of small patches of green on dry dirt, and everyone's uniforms including the officers, looked dirty, old, and wrinkled. Even in the daytime, the place seemed dark. There were also so many large black crows in the trees that they had to put a bird banger in the middle of the compound. It was an acoustic bird deterrent that when it fired, it emitted a cannon-type sound that helped to scare the birds away. The birds ignored it. It went off every minute echoing throughout the compound. The constant explosions coupled with the loud barking and croaking sounds from the birds all day and night made this place like a modern day horror movie. On one side of the projects were the natives, on another side were the crypts, on the back side were the bloods. Go past the rec room were the bikers, the skinheads, Aryan Brotherhood affiliates, Mongol affiliates, and the Mexican Mafia affiliates. The DC Blacks, were by the side of the canteen and laundry. 